Hi, my name is Jessica Gowers. I am the communications manager for the Elgin Middlesex Oxford Workforce Planning and Development Board. And I'm here today to talk to you about passion in the workforce. So those of you who are familiar with the Elgin Middlesex Oxford Workforce Planning and Development Board, you would know that we host live monthly webinars, but because of the content of this video, we decided that we wanted to upload it on Valentine's Day which is a Sunday this year. So we decided that instead of hosting a live webinar on a Sunday, we would upload it to our YouTube channel. We're gonna talk about passion today because we need to look beyond just the numbers when we're talking about workforce development. The left brain actually drives a lot of issues pertaining to the labor force. Additionally, workforce development includes boosting workplace morale so that you're working in a better environment and the staff are more content and there's higher satisfaction. Especially working from home, sometimes you have to wonder what motivates you to get up and go to work in the morning. Uh, like, is it something different every day? Is it the same thing every day? Is it because you have to? Is it because you have kids? Is it because you have bills? And if that's the case, then it's really difficult to stay motivated. First, to start the video off, I want to talk about the definition of passion so that you yourself can hear this definition and wonder, does this sound like me? Do I have passion for my job? And additionally, employers, you can hear this definition and think, does this ring a bell for what I observe my staff to be acting like and to be exhibiting? So passion is defined as a love for an activity that is considered extremely important to an individual they input a lot of time and energy into this activity to the point that it becomes internalized and part of their identity. Although there are many people who are not passionate about their jobs, there are people who are, and researchers have categorized this type of workplace passion into two categories. So in the workplace, you can have harmonious passion or you can have obsessive passion. We're gonna begin by talking about harmoniously passionate workers. Harmonious passion does not, although it takes place in the workplace, it does not have any feeling of obligation or constraint. And the person who is harmoniously passionate about their job feels in control of that passion. What the harmoniously passionate person and the obsessively passionate person have in common is that they both love their job. So that definition that I just gave you about passion, both of those um, categories of passion like survive off that definition. So they both really, really love what they do. They're both very, very invested in what they're doing for work. They really, really love their job. But the difference is, is that the harmoniously passionate person feels in control of that passion. Whereas the obsessively passionate person is not in control of that passion because it's tied to self-esteem, validation, social acceptance, and even sometimes just extremely high expectations of them from a manager, from a boss, from colleagues. And so there are contingencies placed on their passion for their job. The obsessively passionate person may appear as a workaholic, but there's a key difference here because the obsessively passionate person truly, truly, truly loves what they're doing. They just can't help but engage in it. Similar to a workaholic, they're always working, but they can't help but engage to it because of that self-esteem and those external and internal pressures that are tied to that position. Harmonious passion is associated with more positive perceptions, better workplace satisfaction, and a lower level of exhaustion from work. Whereas obsessively passionate people feel more anxiety, they face more conflict, they have more negative emotions, and they tend to be less satisfied with the position that they're in. The reason that it's important to highlight these different types of passion, the harmoniously passionate person and the obsessively passionate person, is because you yourself may resonate with one of these descriptions and it may give you the opportunity to better understand how you work and how you feel about your job as well as for the employers it may give you an opportunity to better understand your staff and understand the dedication that they have for the position where it comes from how it can be fostered and how it can be changed so as we're beginning to see passion in the workplace is not ju just completely straightforward employers have to be really cautious and conscious of how they're promoting passion to their employees because if they're only if they're trying to promote passion in the way of treating an employee significantly better when they do more work when they're performing at a more vigorous rate this can cause 
or um, initiate obsessive passion when really it's the harmonious passion that is the most valuable to the workplace. Specifically, it's that key component of treating an employee significantly better when they work harder and they're staying late or they're meeting their targets or they're really, really excelling. That in a way is dangerous because it can so quickly be tied to their self-esteem that they think that they have to work that hard to get the approval of others. And really, it's taking the control away from that worker who loves what they do and has the potential to have great job satisfaction, to have a really healthy relationship with their job. Let's take a second to talk about what researchers are hypothesizing as the two greatest origins to lack of motivation in the workplace. So there's two of them. The first one is a combination of high job demand and low job control. And the second one is considerable efforts that are going uncompensated. However, what this research and this hypothesis does not tell us is who is perceiving their job in this way? Who is more likely, the most likely to perceive their job in this way? Who is the most likely to perceive that their efforts are going uncompensated? Because of this, in 2014, organizational researchers were looking at what individual characteristics makes a person more likely to perceive their job in a positive or negative way. And it was found that high pressure positions, role ambiguity, and emotional demands were linked to health problems in employees, while performance feedback support and job control were associated with a higher work investment and an organizational commitment. What this means is that the perception of the individual is really, really important here. It's not exclusively what the employer is doing. It's not exclusively how employers promote passion in the workplace. Humans are curious intellectual beings and one of the many ways that we learn is through experience. These experiences unique to our own lives shape how we see the world around us, especially at work, a place where we spend one third of our time. And especially for people who have been in the same job or the same working with the same company for 10, 15, 20, 30 years. So if two employees were working for the exact same company in the exact same position, our experience with human behavior would tell us that these two employees, although everything is the exact same, would perceive their position in this company differently. The degree of difference that their perception would be is up for debate, but for the purposes of this example, it's also very likely that one person would perceive the position possibly as unorganized, unguided, unsupported, and very high stress, while the other person would see the exact same thing, but they would perceive it as that their employer trusts them, gives them a lot of responsibility, and that's an opportunity to take pride in what they're doing. The onus for workplace passion is placed on employers to carry their team with appreciation and empathy, as well as the individual employees to where possible guide their mindset to a more optimistic and enthusiastic place. One of the recommendations for employers is that they really need to be careful and cautious about how they promote passion in the workplace. So I'm gonna give you some good ways to promote passion in the workplace, but I also wanna tell you something to avoid. Ways that you can avoid developing obsessively passionate workers is by not only compensating them, not only recognizing their efforts when they're going above and beyond. Because you don't want a worker to be working for your approval. You want them to be working because they really, really care about what they're doing and they really enjoy it. Now let's talk about emotional intelligence and soft skills because passion is so closely related with those two things. Emotional intelligence refers to self-awareness, social awareness, self-management and relationship management and all of these things are extremely crucial in the workplace and in fact they're a lot more important to employers than what you may originally think while you may guess that qualification based skills are really what employers are looking for those job descriptions that are saying required three years of school required five years of work experience while those things are important what's actually proving to be the most important factor to employers on whether they hire someone or not is if they're presenting those soft skills. Soft skills can include decision making, independence, flexibility, great communication skills, all of those things that make you someone who is really great to work with and someone who is really great to be on a team. Because emotional intelligence and soft skills are so important for career development and productivity in the workplace, employers should be placing a lot of priority on 
encouraging this behavior from their employees. And the best way to do that is by modeling it themselves. Soft skills can also be what people find really fun about their job. For myself as a communications manager, I love, 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 love the creativity that I'm able to have in my job and the ability to communicate with others and do a lot of really great networking. So remember our definition of passion earlier, where passion is ingrained in our concept of self and in our identity. Well, creative responsibilities allows your employees to inject themselves into their work. And the reverse effect is also true. Creativity at its core really inspires people to work together. They are willing to go and reach out to partners to achieve their vision, or they wanna bounce their ideas off somebody. Allowing room for creativity in these job descriptions really gives your employees another reason to be proud of what they're doing. And it presents itself like you really trust them and you trust their ideas. And an employee feeling trusted by their employer can really go a long way in the other soft skills that I mentioned, like integrity, like ethics, like decision making. Giving your employees this type of security really promotes innovative solutions, problem solving, and it avoids the unproductive ruts that come with a lack of motivation. Now, I wanna talk about integrity in the workforce. Integrity is another soft skill, and I would argue it's one of the most valuable soft skills that your employees can have. Integrity is a key component to ensuring that a product or service is presented in the way that the employer wants it to be if they were available to do it themselves all the time. Integrity is represented in the workplace as employees being timely, reliable, open and honest and accountable for their actions. When I think of the most valuable core staff members at all of the places that I've worked, these core staff members have integrity. They are people who lead by example, they're people who take pride in what they do and they're people who are always ready to work. Encouraging integrity in the workplace goes back to the two components that I've already mentioned that employers should really try to avoid. The first one being not compensating or recognizing the work that your employees are doing. And the second is only recognizing an employee when they do an extra amount of work. Instead, the key to encouraging integrity in the workforce is to treat everyone the same, take a balanced approach to rewarding or recognizing employee efforts, keep your promises, admit your own mistakes, and remain professional. The last thing I want to talk about today is how an employer can support their workforce with mental health and beyond. 42% of global employees report that they have had their mental health decline since the start of the pandemic. As we know, COVID-19 breeds anxiety and the restrictions are leaving employees feeling frustrated and confused. While mental health has always been an issue to prioritize in the workforce, COVID-19 is making a detrimental contribution to the hopelessness, lack of motivation, and that feeling of Groundhog Day that a lot of employees are facing. So what can employers do? Similar to the reoccurring theme of this video, they need to lead by example. By modeling healthy behaviors, you're letting your employees know that you don't just say that you care about mental health. A lot of times employers are really concerned about their employees and the business itself and they forget to check in with themselves. Share what you as the boss are doing to cope with your own issues of mental health and be vulnerable. An another thing you can do is you can build a culture of check-in at your workplace. Go beyond just asking how are you, really try to engage with your employees. Instead of asking the close-ended questions, try to ask more open-ended questions like what did you enjoy most about this weekend, what are your plans for the long weekend, things like that. In complement of the check-in culture, just make sure that when you're asking everyone these open-ended questions, don't leave anyone out really, really try to include everyone in the conversation. In a lot of instances, people will say that one person cannot make a difference. And to end this video, I would like to leave you with the following sentiment. If you are in an office setting with a handful of people that you see every day and you talk to every day, if you ensure that empathy is at the forefront of those interactions, you will make a difference. Thank you for joining me today to talk about the effects of passion in the workplace and what love's got to do with it. Happy Valentine's Day and enjoy your long weekend.